on today's Locked on Jayhawks, joined by Scott Chasen as we go over some KU football stuff, but also look ahead to the KU basketball season. You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. me as well on Rock Chalk Sports Talk from 3 to 6 on KLWN in Lawrence. Thanks for making Locked on Jayhawks your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And on today's edition of Locked on Jayhawks, we're joined by Scott Chasen. You can catch him as well on Booth Review with Kansas City Sports Network. Scott, how's everything going today? I see you got the uh, Phoenix Suns gear on. You ready for the NBA season? A little classic stuff, and it's a little chilly, so I can break out a hoodie Derek, I got a bone to pick with you, which, first of all, how about the production value of Locked On Jayhawks moving up in the world? Um, every week, I have been like, Derek, are we going on YouTube? When do we get to do video? When do we get to do video? I moved, okay? I don't have my decorations, my wall, my new studio set up. I'm also sick. And this is the week that Derek said, let's get you on video. Let's make sure everyone can see what Scott Jason looks like. This man hates me, and I want all of you to hate him too so great show love the content you know how people say like good writer better person great host worst person i'm not a Derek johnson fan well uh <laughs> we'll try to get you through the episode anyway despite the uh negative comments to me by the way today's episode is brought to you by bet online bet online has you covered this season with more props odds and lines than ever before bet online where the game starts so on today, like I said, we're going to talk a little KU basketball. I do want to open up with a little KU football here, though. Right now, Kansas sitting at 5-2, and two, Jason Bean taking over a quarterback. And I think all things considered, if you view from a lens of he is your backup quarterback, you're, you're impressed with what he's done so far. But also, if you view it from the standpoint of, well, we were told there wasn't that big of a drop-off from Jalen Daniels to Jason Bean, then you would just be wrong because there is a sizable drop-off there between the two. Uh, let's just play this out. And, and I don't mean to be negative, like right off the bat here, because to be clear, I know both of us still think Kansas, uh, there is another win, maybe two in there for them to reach bowl eligibility. But just hypothetically, if Kansas did finish five and seven this season, would you view it as a successful season? I view it as a bummer um, because that's what it would be. Uh, now, look, I think when you look back on the season, you would say, yes, it was successful. It was growth, especially if Jalen Daniels does not return. Um, if he does return and you lose more games, I think that would be more of a bummer. But again, you would see the progress the team is making, the better talent, the depth, and say, okay, now how do they get that to bowl eligibility? Because a lot of these guys are going to be back next year too. So this is really a two-year window for this staff to capitalize on that talent. So, you know, I, I would say no. I, I actually would say this would still be successful or no to it being not a success, however you want to phrase that. Um, but I, it would be a bummer. I think fans would be disappointed, especially with that last game coming against K-State. I think I, I agree with you, though. I've seen enough to think this team is going to get another win. Um, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that they wouldn't. But at this point, if you ask me what's more likely, 7-5 and five or 5-7, five and seven, I'd probably say 7-5. and five. So um, I, I still feel good about the talent on this team. They just got to clean a few things up, be more consistent offensively have more success defensively like they had the last two weeks leading up to the Oklahoma game. And I think they'll be okay. Yeah. And I do agree with you. I, I think you're going to be in enough 50, 50 games that a couple should go your way some way or another. They're competitive enough in, in so many ways. I do think though, if they did finish five and seven, it would be really weird to figure out if we would have, you know, before the season started said, Hey, Kansas is going to win five games. Would you take it? I think you probably would have said yes. Now, I, I know my host on my co-host on Rock Chalk Sports Talk, Nick Springer, brought up a good point um, before the season. He said, was I, it I would a good point. Them. Was it a good point, well, Derek? Well, I, I mean, the idea, he said, I would almost rather them win four games than five, because if you win five, you're going to be the entire time wondering, oh, but if they would have just this happened in that game or they were so close, they could have made a bowl. They were one win away and it's going to be the what ifs, whereas with the four. It's still an improvement and everything. The most wins that you've had in you know, over a decade, all that stuff. The five wins would be a success, but you're right. Based on the fact that you would be one away from a bowl and because it would be such, as you said, a bummer with the way that you finished the season here by losing the last seven, I think I would have enough in me to be able to step back and say, yes, overall, it was a success. 
it's just hard to kind of separate those two things. Um, and, and I think that, I guess there still is a situation out there where, Hey, five and seven Kansas makes it to a bowl game because there's not enough bowl eligible teams. I don't know what their APR score is. I, I did some research on this, trying to find it. Uh, the last one that I found up there was from the, I think 2020 to 21 season. So that wouldn't even apply for this year. That year, Kansas ranked in the eighties in the country. I don't know how much of that carries over from one year to the next, or if it's just completely based on the graduating class and it can completely flip one year to another. Uh, my point is there, don't just figure that Kansas can make a bowl game at five and seven. You need to get to six and six. So um, I, I think more than anything, if you don't get to bowl eligibility at this point, it's more of a, and I, I feel like sometimes I say this too much when, when they lose a close game, but it's a missed opportunity because of mm-hmm. the momentum you could have had as a program making a bowl game and the extra month of practices you could have had yeah. for making a bowl game would be huge for this team. That, that's exactly where I was going to go. And I would just clarify and say, the reason I say bummer is because you started 5-0, and right? Like, I mean, first of all, the fifth win could be that Kansas State game in some fantasy season where you played out. And then you'd say, well, yeah, I'd much rather win five than four. I'd rather, you know, be four and seven going into that last game and win. But even if they got that fifth win against Texas Tech, hypothetically, with two games to go, you you still wouldn't necessarily feel like a bummer, right? It It, it would feel that way because they started 5-0, and and then to have that lasting image be loss after loss after loss after loss. Now, I will say this is different than the Mangino 5-7 and seven, um, for one obvious reason. Well, several, but that was the end of an era and of a great team and of great pieces. This is maybe not the start. Maybe it's in the middle, um, but it's at least early in Lance Leipold's time. It's early in Jalen Daniels' time. And, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I was kind of the guy before the season saying, Hey, you don't get to say that the talent on the roster has improved and it's Big 12 caliber and that Jalen's a top Big 12 quarterback and then pick him to win two, three games. I said that a number of times, a number of places. Those two thoughts don't align. If you think Jalen Daniels is good, you think the coaching staff is good and you think the talent has improved, you're kind of a coward if you're picking this team to win two to three games or you're just lying and telling people what they want to hear. Um, I, I think what you've seen is a team that's legitimately good that can win games and has won games, can win, can be in 50-50 games, and then add another year of growth on top of that, I think there's a lot of optimism still out there for what they could be next year. So um, that's why I think you have to look at this as a two-year window, and that's why I say bummer, not disappointment, um, just because it, it wouldn't be disappointing. You would look back on it a month after the season and maybe go, oh, um, you know, I wish they made a bowl game, but y- you would still be like, wow, they showed a lot of growth in a short amount of time. All right, in just a moment, we're going to get on to some KU basketball talk. But first, if you get sweaty or have body odor or maybe you just accidentally didn't realize that it was going to go from like, you know, 40 to 50 degrees over these last few days and you walked into work all bundled up and then it's 80 degrees like it's going to be every day over the course of this weekend because Kansas weather is weird and you're overdressed and you're sweating and you're worried about how you smell at work. I mean, that's that's happened to a lot of people, and I'm sure it certainly does around here in Kansas. Well, check out Sweatblock. Sweatblock has created uh, a, a perfect system to help you with all of these needs. It was created by a doctor to help with his own excessive sweating, and it's doctor created and doctor recommended. If you or someone you love is experiencing sweat or odor, try Sweatblock. You can save 20% off with promo code locked on at sweatblock.com, also available on Amazon. So we have some KU basketball football crossover questions that I want to get to here in a little bit. But um, the first things first, the three biggest concerns for KU basketball in 2022 to 2023. I'll let you go first. What's your biggest concern for this team? Yeah, if anyone's wondering why I'm laughing, by the way, it's because I'm a psychopath and came up with a joke in my own head and I thought it was so funny. But when you called it a KU football a uh, basketball crossover. I was like, yeah, that's how Dylan Gabriel fumbled the ball uh, literally in the last game. So I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, okay. Three biggest concerns. Number one to me is the five spot. And it's, it's the five spot, a number of different ways. I think he has good players who can play the fives Zach Clemens returning a couple of freshmen, but they're so drastically different stylistically. And think about bill self. Um, I heard Nick Schwartz talking about the most important positions for bill self point guard and center. I'll take it a step further. Um, bill self 
sets his identity based around his five spot. And you only have to look into the history of KU team to figure that out. Whenever KU has had a dominant team that has a good big man, they go through that big man no matter what. You could point to last year's team. Everything started with Doak, went outside from there. You could go to that team that had Doak and Dieter together when Doak got injured. They were number one in the country. Then after that, had kind of a mediocre year. They had Quentin Grimes. They had Devon Dotson. A lot of hype coming into the season. Bill Self said after the first game, Doak is the first option of the KU offense. Or he said that after the Champions Classic. So the big man sets the tone for how Bill Self's offense is going to work, um, whether it's someone more in the – Landon Lucas mold or or a different one. Okay, that guy doesn't score. Then it's going to be more guard oriented, whatever. I don't think he knows what it has right now with those big men. And they're so different stylistically. Zach Clements, are you going to design an offense to get him the ball out on the perimeter? Are you going to have rim runners like Zuby and Ernest that that can get to the basket? Where does Cam Martin fit into this? And then defensively, who can emerge as that rebounder, rim protector, paint, paint presence, maybe even lane protector if you can't be a rim protector? I just think there are so many questions and it's not like you can come up with one answer or or if for any answer you choose, it drastically changes the style of which KU plays. And I think that's a big deal. And that's why you heard that Bill Self quote the other day where he said, it's great to have a bunch of guys who could play. I'd rather have one who I can count on for 30 minutes and then know who that guy's backup is because then you can decide on a style. So I would say it's, it's not necessarily the five spot, but it's, letting the five spot spot dictate the style that the team wants to play on both ends. I think that's a huge concern for KU right now. Yeah. I actually asked Bill uh, about how he envisions the five spot going this year. And and one thing he brought up, he said uh, at at big 12 media days, he said, you know, we could have four guys play 10 minutes each and then get them all on the floor and we could figure stuff out, but then you probably have four unhappy guys, or you could have one guy play 25 and one guy play 15. And you'd have two unhappy guys, but you'd have two happy guys, you know? So um, I, I thought it was kind of interesting how he uh, coined mm-hmm. that. I had that originally in one of my three, so I'll just create a new one. Uh, but the number one question I have is honestly shooting. I, I think mm-hmm. that Grady Dick could be really good as a shooter, but it, it is it going to be just as good as Ochai was, right? Are you really going to count on a freshman to come in and shoot 40% from three on six, seven, eight attempts per game? What if it's only 35% and he's your go-to three-point shooter? And what if the shooting for Kevin McCuller and Jalen Wilson, which should be improved, it should be better, but what if it's not? What if it's just the same as the last couple of years, inconsistent and hovering around the 30% mark? What if Dewan Harris doesn't really add to his three-point game? We know he's capable of hitting them, but can he? Like, I don't think he's ever going to be a guy who's hitting them like off movement, running around a screen, catching and shooting. But can he be like what Frank Mason was over his final two years? Where if a guy went under a screen, Frank would pick up his dribble and he'd shoot in the three and he shot it at high percentage. So maybe you don't have to shoot, you know, 45% or whatever Frank did shoot as a senior, but to that that, level, yeah. yeah, Can can you at least like do similar stuff on maybe 35%, right? Something like that. Um, And then you look at the center position, what we're talking about there with the interior presence. If Zach Clements isn't the guy that takes off one three point shooter that you were kind of counting on from the floor. Like Ernest Dude and Zuby Edgefer aren't going to be three point shooters for this team. So three point shooting to me is is kind of the biggest question that I have for how efficient they can kind of be on the offensive end. And if you're not a team who can dump it down in the post, there's going to be more pressure on you hitting outside shots. Yeah, I'll add on to that and say shooting was going to be one of mine. I'll say dynamic scoring um, because you're right. Look, Grady Dick. First of all, this is going to be a good KU team. They're going to win a lot of games, but. We'll, you know, we're talking about the margins, the things that take you over the top to have those really special seasons. And one thing you need is a advanced shot maker and freshmen don't always, you know, they often struggle with that, especially three point shooting. And usually they make that big jump their second year. And the reason why, I mean, it's pretty simple. The players are athletic, bigger, they close out a little bit faster. Your rhythm changes. You might be tweaking your shot a little bit or doing something different with your release point. You're, you're in a different weight program. You're it's a different schedule. There's just a lot of stuff there. Um, that sometimes makes it a little bit harder. Now, Jalen Wilson, Kevin McCullough haven't shot it well from three. Jalen Wilson spent more time under 30 than over 30. That's a problem. Um, Both of those guys need to be better. And if you listen to Bill Self on the late night broadcast, when Kevin McCullough took a two-point jumper, he was like, it's not a good shot. He can make those. We kind of need to get him making threes. Um, That was kind of, again, I don't want to say alarm bells, because again, we're talking about concerns. Um, And again, it's the things on the margins, but that it, it raised a little bit of concern, I would say for me. And then there's Dewan Harris, who I think Dewan Harris is a very good player. 
I think Dewan Harris is a very steady presence. Um, but Bill Self was telling a story at media day where he dominated a practice and didn't score a single point. Um, that Again, you – you don't necessarily need one hair shooting 20 times a game, but you need somebody to take on that dynamic scoring role. Um, I don't know if MJ Rice could maybe be that. I don't know if there's another guy on the roster. Maybe Joe Yesifu can do a little bit more, but they've got to find it. And, you know, it's not a problem until it burns you. And maybe this will just be an elite defensive team and they'll have to win games ugly. But the two or the, the core Bill Stuff principle, right? Get easy buckets and stop your opponent from scoring easy buckets. And then I think he's added to that in recent years where he said, who's that guy that, that can go get you a shot? Okay. Um, I, I'm struggling to see this early in the season, how KU gets the easy buckets. Now, other than Bill Self scheming up great plays, I do think they'll be able to prevent easy buckets. I think this team will be great defensively by the end of the year elite. And then who is that guy that can go and get you a shot? Is that Grady Dick? If it is absolutely fantastic, he's a great, you know, obviously a high school prospect. But if it's not, and if it's, you know, maybe Jalen Wilson has some of that, but can he do it consistently? Can he shoot the ball well? I think they need dynamic scoring, and I don't totally know who that comes from. I think they're going to be really good in transition, and I think that I, I think Jalen is going to be that guy for them. So I, I'm not as worried mm-hmm. on on that, but I, I do see what you're saying. Like, it's it's a very short list of how you get to that point where you're questioning that similar to what the KU team was, I think two years ago, right? That was kind of the question for that team. Uh, my next one I would go with, I would just say the youth in general, um, mm-hmm. Bill self teams have tended to be better when they're older as our most, you know, college basketball coaches and, and college basketball teams. I kind of could see this being a team that has kind of a slow start to the season. They pick it up and then maybe it's, Hey, you had kind of a, a down freshman season, but that means instead of you being a one and done, you're back for year two. And now you're going to be an all American in year two, something like that. I can see that being the case for a couple of guys for KU. It's just the question of the youth for me. Yeah. I was going to say reliance on freshmen, but I have kind of another backup one. That's kind of, it's in my mind. I, I don't know the the real, the truthful answer is I genuinely do not know how big a concern this is right now, but I think it's keeping that backcourt rotation healthy, happy, active and engaged. And I'm talking about Dwan Harris, Bobby Pefford, and Joe Yesifu. You know, maybe Kyle Cuff comes along and he's a, a little bit farther along than maybe I, I think he is, or maybe they think he is. I don't know. But they're obviously very high on Bobby Pettiford, right? How many times have we heard he's the next great Kansas guard? Okay, but the health has been an issue. And it sounds like it's kind of continued to be an issue. Okay, then let's talk about Joe Yesifu. They went and got him because he was that shot creator, dynamic scorer. And it kind of turned out he was focusing so much on defense. Bill Self had a quote, I've got him so worried about defense. I've, you know, I've messed him up. He can't score anymore. Um, I think that trio, one of the ways to get around some of those shortcomings I was talking about where maybe you don't have a dynamic score is to do something differently than your opponent. One of the ways is get two point guards on the floor next to each other. And in fact, I talked about this a lot last year. You know, when people were criticizing Dewan Harris and saying, why isn't Remy playing over him? I said, People are looking at this wrong because Remy Martin, if healthy, would have been playing next to Dewan Harris. And then everyone would love Dewan Harris because he'd be in that Russell Robinson role, that complimentary guard next to the, the you know, streaky shooting, you know, tech tech or whatever. Um, and, and you would notice all the little things he's doing. And I kind of think it's the same way. Like, I think they can elevate Dewan Harris's game by playing him next to another ball handling guard and then rotate three or three wings with Brady Dick, Jalen Wilson, Kevin McCuller, um, you know, have two on the court at, at any given time. I think that ends up being pretty huge for this team. I would just say this kind of goes in line with my youth thing too, but in, in a little bit of, of like with Bobby Pettiford and Joe Yesavu, what are the year one to year two jumps going to be for guys who were with the program last year for their first year? What are their jumps going to be into year two? You're, you're counting on at least one of Yesifu or Pettiford to, or, or even Kyle Cuff to, to step up and be kind of that that second guard who can come on and play next to Dewan or can be kind of his backup throughout the game. KJ Adams, Zach Clements, Cam Martin, like what are any of those going to look like? Are they going to be much improved from last year? Can KJ start shooting threes? So uh, I think that's the other question for me. Okay, I do have some uh, either ors, some crossover questions between uh, both football and basketball here. First one, more likely, KU football wins seven games or KU basketball makes the Elite Eight? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think history would tell you that coming off of seasons where you win a national championship, it's really hard 
um, to advance far in the tournament. I know you have a great stat about that. I won't steal that from you. Um, I, I would say probably with where I'm at with this KU team, I think the bar for them should be what the bar was for the 2008-2009 team, which is, you know, play to your seed line, maybe get to a Sweet 16, and if you do more than that, great. Again, they won a national championship last year. So, you know, we, we can be reasonable with how much talent they have to replace. If you can do better than than a Sweet 16, totally in the realm of possibility, by the way. They absolutely could. Their preseason top 10, they're a little higher than I would have them. Totally in the realm of possibility. That's great. Um Man, I, I think that's really close. I actually think it's super even. I'd probably say, you, you know what, I've talked myself into KU basketball. Maybe it's more like the Elite Eight because you didn't say Final Four. But I think both of those things are possible. I think both could happen. Um, it would not shock me if it ended KU football at six wins in Kansas in the Sweet 16, just because it's it's, it's really hard to rebuild and retool. But if they keep a lot of these guys around, then I think Kansas basketball could, again, be incredibly dominant You know, a year from now. Yeah, I almost view this like rebuilding here isn't the right way. They have to retool. Mm-hmm. They'll still be really good. They'll be a top 10 team, yeah. probably get like a top three seed or whatever in the tournament. It's just, yeah, that stat that you mentioned, the reason I picked the Elite Eight, the only team who's even made it to the Elite Eight or further in after coming back as a national champion over the last whatever amount of years was Florida since I think like 2002 or something. And, and that was because they returned yeah. everyone. So uh, it, it's really hard to do. It, it is really, really hard to do. I'd probably go with the KU football winning seven games because of that. But Kansas still has a lot of talent. So if they buck that trend, it wouldn't be like overly shocking or anything. I mean, yeah. if Baylor has a couple other things go their way after that comeback against North Carolina, I don't know. They're probably in the Elite Eight. Maybe they're further as well last year. So it, it, it can the, the tournament's just so fickle, which I think is a, a point for that and a point kind of against that. Uh, Will KU basketball ever drop below what the high point was for KU football in the AP poll this year? So as of now, it'd be 19th, unless you think they're going to work back above that in football. Uh, I I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, just how they schedule, how they play, um, and their reputation, how good a coach Bill Self is. um, Again, it wouldn't, I I would be surprised if this team ever fell out of the AP top 25. Um, I, to be clear, I'm not picking this wouldn't shock me if this team ended up as like a four or five seed um if things didn't work out now obviously if they did work out it wouldn't shock me if this team ended as a two seed um maybe even a one seed just based off where they are preseason and if everything hits the way you know Grady Dick is the best freshman in the nation that's these are all outcomes that are possible to me um I don't expect Kansas to fall out of the rankings though ever and um by that I mean am I expecting them to fall to 20 or below kind of splitting hairs there so I'll say no. Um, I, I don't think that's likely. I think KU will probably wire to wire be in the 10 to 20 ish range and, and kind of settle there, which, you know, for the record is still very fine and gives you a chance to win in March. If everything is hitting, I think I would take basketball, but it wouldn't be shocking if I think they had a week, like what if they lose to Duke and then they lose in the Bahamas, like a game or two there, maybe they drop to 21 or something. I don't know. It's possible. But- I don't think, if, I don't think they would. I think if they lost two quickly, I think they'd still, I think they'd have to lose another one. Yeah, you're probably right. Uh, okay. Last one. You have to make a trade of one KU football starter for one KU basketball player to try to keep both teams as competitive as possible. What's the trade? What is How about uh, for anyone watching and or listening to this, um, normally when a guest goes on a talk show, um, like maybe you watch Late Night with James Corden or Jimmy Fallon or um, Jimmy Kimmel, I guess they're all named Jimmy. um, They talk about the anecdotes they're going to go over and the questions they're going to be asked ahead of time. And then it's like, wow, those are great anecdotes. (laughs) They came up on the spot. I'm I'm trading KJ Adams to the football team because they already have a lot of wings. So you mm-hmm. can survive being I, I do think KJ Adams is gonna play a serious role on this team. So KJ Adams might be kind of important this year, Derek. Yeah, I, I think he's gonna be very important. <laughs> and I love KJ Adams' game. I love what he brings to the table. He mm-hmm. does so many like off the ball things. But uh nonetheless, I think he would be amazing at football, like a defensive end or a linebacker or something. Um, I also think that if you're bringing someone back the other way, they're not really helping basketball in any way. So I don't think it really matters who you put on the basketball team. <laughs> wow. Okay, so that was a cop out answer. Uh, uh, man. It's really tough because I was like, oh, Jalen Daniels was a legendary right, we'll basketball Casey, player. Because he'll be like James Sosinski. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I'll tell you this, though. This is like the reverse answer to your question. 
I would not take KJ Adams off this KU basketball team. And I'll make, I'll, I'll trade you an answer to this question for a super bold prediction. You ready for this one? Yeah, let's do it. I think there's a legitimate chance that KJ Adams is the key to unlocking the very best of KU basketball this year. I see the potential for an elite, elite defensive lineup with KJ Adams, Kevin McCuller, DeWan Harris, and then you plug in the other two. Maybe it's not Grady Dick. Maybe it's not MJ Rice. Maybe it's another guard. Maybe it's Pedford. Maybe it's Yesifu. If Jalen Wilson can be, you know, at times last year he got picked on, at times he held his own. I think you start a foundation with those three guys, Kevin McCuller, KJ Adams, DeWan Harris. And that has the potential to be one of the greatest teams, like in the, you know, statistically in the Ken Palm era of college basketball. Like when you look at lineup data, I, I think that could be up there with those teams. Those three guys are not only elite defensively, um, Dewan Harris struggles a little bit when bigger guards post him up, but they are so versatile and they can defend so many different positions that if you, if you told me like a weird tidbit and you said something like KJ Adams finished third on KU in minutes in the NCAA tournament. I'd say I bet you KU has one of the best five defenses in the nation um, because that's why he's on the, you know, on the court because Bill Self, maybe he doesn't even like want to play him there, but he he can't take him off because he's that good. Um, you know, it's just me theorizing. So that's my, that's my little bold prediction there that I think if, if it all works out, I, I think you can build a, an elite, elite defensive lineup with KJ Adams, who I know you're a fan of too. Yes, Sam. All right. We got to run quick for our worst coaching decisions of the week in just a second. BetOnline.net is your number one source for football betting information this season. Find all of the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis on every game you can find. And as always, BetOnline remains your continued source for all your sport wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. With BetOnline, right now you can get Kansas at plus seven and a half plus 255 money line for the Baylor game, an over-under of 58, which has actually dropped from like the uh, 60s. Also, if you want to take them to repeat as national champions, you can get them at 14 to 1 right now on Bet Online. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite games and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, college football, NFL, college basketball, and golf. Head to BetOnline.net or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. Okay, so Scott, uh, we have your worst coaching decisions of the week. Who are the mm -hmm. candidates this week? Well, real quick, and I'll go quickly. It's all concise. Just on the leaderboard for anyone keeping track, you get three points for being the worst coach of the week. You get one point for an honor honorable mention. Um, number three, there's a tie with four people. It's Zach Taylor um, of the Bengals, Jimbo Fisher, Neil Brown, and Nathaniel Hackett's special decisions coach. So they're tied for third. Matt Campbell is currently in second, number two. Um, he has four points, and then number one is Nathaniel Hackett, who has seven points. So seven points is lapping the field currently. Here are the three, and for the first time ever, we have a little bit of history. Um, th we have two bad decisions that came on the same drive in a football game. So that's very exciting. The first one, Brent Venables at Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma had a minute left. It was a third down play, final drive before the first half. They took 40 seconds off the clock, bled it to 20. Um, I know people wanted KU to call a timeout, but my philosophy with that is if your opponent's going to let you know, make a mistake, let them, uh, don't interrupt them. I think that's like Sun Tzu, the art of war, um, not to go all Andy Kotal Nicky and just start quoting people. But so they ran 40 seconds off the clock. Then they got down to the two yard line. They ran out of time, didn't get a touchdown. So it hurt them. Um, Brian Borland, KU defensive coordinator, 16 seconds left in the half, had kind of a bizarre defense with eight guys on the goal line. Um, Oklahoma still had 16 seconds. So they threw a wide receiver screen, immediately got the ball down to the two, had a couple shots at a touchdown. I thought that was kind of bizarre there. Number three, Nick Saban uh, in the Alabama-Tennessee game. By the way, none of these coaches are getting fired this week. Um, that's very apparent to me. Uh, Alabama had the ball to 32. There were 34 seconds left in the tie game. They threw three incomplete passes, no runs, then missed the field goal. Tennessee took the ball and got a field goal as time expired in regulation. You don't have to run every time. Derek, you have to run one time. You, you have to run a single time in that situation. And uh, so those are my three. Do you have a pick? Can we go with Nick Saban just because it's just he's never going to be on there again, probably? <laughs> We're going with Nick Saban. Yeah. Nick Saban, the worst coach in college football for a single decision that I saw. There were many games that I didn't watch this week. I wasn't feeling great. Um, yes, we are giving this award to Nick Saban, who, let me check my notes real quick, 
Uh, yeah, that is his first time either being nominated or winning the award. So congratulations to Nick Saban. Um, I'm sure he will take this as motivation. Alabama will not lose another game and they'll win the national championship. Yeah, perfect. And, you know, Nick Saban has won so many awards. Uh, what can you give a man that has everything? You can give him an award he doesn't have. So it's uh, perfect. Well, Scott, appreciate the time as always, man. Thanks for having me. Yep, you can check him out as well with Booth Review on Kansas City Sports Network. Coming up on tomorrow's show, uh, we were going to preview the KU game against Baylor. If you have anything that you would like for the show to talk about or want to follow along on the action, you can reach out at D Johnson Radio on Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to the show so you're getting all the latest with Locked On Jayhawks. That'll do it for today's episode. Have a good rest of your day. I'll see some of you on Rock Chalk Sports Talk later today. Adios.